Hey folks, welcome to the 188th episode of the Intellectual Podcast. I'm your host, Dave Dawson, coming at you from Austin, Texas. I'm staying with the amazing Kilnas, that's Raven and Kilna, of the Kilna Companies. And uh, yeah, former San Diego filmmakers have been on the podcast themselves, now living here in Austin, Texas. They've got a killer house. Uh, and I know they're going to be doing killer things here in Austin as things move forward for them. Looking forward to hearing the news and we'll catch up with them on the podcast sometime down the road once they've kind of established their footing here in Austin and start making a making a name, which we all know they will. Um, today from Austin, I bring you an interview with a guy named Austin, Mr. Austin Auger, documentary filmmaker, friend of mine, guy I've worked with on corporate audiovisual gigs for several years. He recently did a documentary film about the survivors of the tsunamis in Japan, and we talked at great length about that experience uh, while sitting on the back patio of my hotel room at the JW Marriott in Palm Springs when we were doing a, a gig together recently. So it's a very interesting conversation. Um, I'm always fascinated by documentary filmmakers just for the sheer battle of wills that they go through to accomplish telling a story. Oftentimes being living and, and breathing that story for many years to accomplish it. Um, I find that just awe-inspiring. So here's Austin Auger as I come to you from Austin, Texas on the 188th episode of the Intellectual Podcast. Talk hard and enjoy the mindgasm. The Intellectual Podcast starts now. When we were leaving for dinner last night, there was a goose cross. There's a bunch of geese crossing the road out by the entrance, but this one goose specifically refused to get out of Joey's way. <laughs> Joey honked at it and kind of stopped and looked back at him like, "What?" <laughs> and then just kept walking its merry way. It was walking the same direction we were going, so it was walking down our lane. <laughs> In the street, and he'd like, yeah, he'd like go to move to the other lane, and it would like turn and look at him, like, "Where do you think you're going?" <laughs> and start moving with us. <laughs> so he's like, "Dude, what the hell?" <laughs> I let the jokes begin. Yeah, no kidding, right? And the guy behind us was getting all pissed off at Joey because he was going too slow, right? What are you supposed to? When do? We get up to the stoplight, we stop, and the goose comes walking out from behind us. <laughs> And the guy behind us like goes to whip around. And he has to hit the brakes real hard. So he's like, that's right, dude. I wasn't just driving slow for no reason. <laughs> Got a fucking goose in my way. <laughs> Got goosed. <laughs> ah, Austin Auger, how you doing? I'm doing well. Living here in a dream in beautiful Palm Springs. Well, so you're, you're on the show. You're, you're, you're a filmmaker like I am. But not like I am. You, you're a documentary filmmaker primarily, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And most recently you did a documentary uh, on Japan and Fukushima. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. So I find it brilliant that you and I are doing a podcast sitting on the balcony of this uh, hotel room in Palm Desert, one of the cities uh, surrounded by... Tons of clean natural energy sources with all the windmills and everything else. Uh, and I'm chatting with a guy who did a documentary about one of the worst nuclear disasters uh, in recent memory or any memory, really. Um, it's crazy. Uh, tell us a little bit about the documentary and, and how you came about making it. Um, well, the, the disaster happened on March 11th, 2011. And they call it their 311, much like uh, our 911 here in America. Mm -hmm. That's how the, the feeling and the sentiment is in Japan. And shortly after that disaster happened, let me start preface this by my dad was born and raised in Japan. He moved here when he was 16. And I still have a lot of family, not in the Fukushima region, but in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. um, and well, Japan's not a huge country, right? So, I mean, even though the disaster happened in a region, it it affected everybody. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. They're, uh, you know, one people with limited resources and you know, it affected everybody up and down, regardless if you got the new nuclear fallout or you didn't get the nuclear fallout. Um, everybody felt 
economic effects, emotional effects. Um, but shortly after the disaster happened, my father, who works for military contracting, got sent out there just days after. And he went there to help remediate the soil. In Japan, you, they're a very advanced country, but they actually didn't have the first responders. They didn't have the education to be able to respond to this disaster. Hmm. So people like my dad went out there, and the, actually the first people who were on the ground in Japan to respond was the uh, LA Fire Department. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Uh, yeah, yes and no. Um, I mean, Americans are, <clears throat> for all our faults, we're really fast first responders to stuff. Uh, around the world, for better or worse. Um, but I, I, I would say there's a huge connection between Japan and, and the West Coast of the United States. So it's not a huge surprise to me that we'd be so quick to respond. It's true. And certainly on our on our coast, we've got several nuclear power plants along the western coast of the United States. My dad worked at a bunch of them. Um, I don't know if you knew that. My dad was no. a nuclear engineer. No, I didn't know that. Yeah. Wow. So the whole nuclear power debate is one that I've seen both sides of. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't think it's a huge surprise um, because we're pretty, we're pretty prepared people for disaster striking. I don't know why, mm -hmm. <laughs> but we mm -hmm. are. I think it's just we have a lot of resources, so that's true too. Um, we just kind of have the ability to have those kinds of preparedness deals put in place for stuff, whether we need it or not. So, for even how for prepared we are, like our San Onofre nuclear power plant, it's only rated for like a seven point something earthquake. That's why it got decommissioned. It's like, yeah, now we're getting in like to the Japan nine point ohs. Yeah. You're you're getting up. Well, I mean, it's it's one of those things, too, is a lot of the nuclear power plants that are currently running were never meant to run more than 50 years. Oh, really? They were, uh, they were the temporary solution. There's two types of nuclear power, um, nuclear power generating plants, and the one that everybody's used to is the least efficient, most dangerous, but cheapest to build. Really? Yeah. I had no idea. <laughs> yeah. Huh. So, um, those those started getting built real fast because you know they're like, oh, introduction to nuclear power. We'll, we'll build these really quick. We can get a lot of them out there, and then over time we'll migrate to the better systems. That was kind of the mentality in in the deal. Um, but before the before the industry could evolve and turn into that the protests hit really hard and the restrictions on nuclear power clamped down super hard in the late sixties, early seventies and pretty much all development on nuclear power stopped in America. Oh, and when it stopped in America, it pretty much halted stopped around the world too. <laughs> so I know so the world stuck with a bunch of nuclear power plants that were never meant to run forever. They were kind of meant to be temporary kickstarts to the nuclear power industry wow. because they were cheaper cheaper and faster to build but not really meant to last that is crazy man i yeah i had no idea there's a really great really documentary like on netflix um oh, i can't remember the name of it but it goes into all of the detail on that huh. it's it's very well balanced documentary um i'll try and remember it before this podcast goes up i'll put the name in the in the uh <laughs> the notes. show notes. Uh, so I'd love check to check out. that out. Oh, it's, yeah, I'd love but to. But it's a very well-balanced uh, depiction of nuclear power, it, completely admitting the negativity of, of where we're at while recognizing the, the truth of how we have been stuck in this place. Um, there's all sorts of nuclear power generation that wouldn't be a disaster for the world. Um, nuclear Nuclear material in small doses is not terribly hard to contain terribly hard to manage um but you say nuclear to anybody right now and they're just like oh you know yeah 
No, no, it's bad. It's bad. Three eyed fish <laughs> that are green. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and you know, get you sick. We're 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 radiated by stuff constantly every day. I mean, that's that's the nature of the universe. Is radiation is everywhere. Um, True. Like up in an airplane when you go up in an airplane. Yeah, but the types of nuclear power plants that we've been building require large concentrations of nuclear ma- material in really dense quantities, which creates a fundamentally dangerous situation. Uh, but you can do nuclear power in much more concentrated, smaller doses. You can build a little nuclear generator that can power you know, several blocks of a city that's no bigger than... You know, like a microwave. Really? Yeah. And contains very, very little nuclear material. That's so true. So, but your dad went out to work on the soil? Yeah, because like what you were saying, boats that are um, powered by nuclear engines, such as like our Navy's submarine, um, he was working in San Diego, remediating the byproduct that comes out of the spent, uh, you know, nuclear engines they would take that and and safely neutralize it Mm -hmm. and so that process in in one way or another was why they got sent to the disaster area so fast after um tepco was actually the name of the power plant there and they were run by uh toshiba toshiba coverage so they they were trying to branch out and now hey we can get out of electronics and we could start powering our electronics right and so they What's bought the one constant across all the electronics. Everything needs power. Smart. I mean, it's yeah. it's the Japanese lateral business expansion thinking. They don't go up and down. They like to go, you know, left and right. Right. In the industry, um, they, with their nuclear ambitions, they bought U- U.S. company um, Westinghouse, which is now uh, have a lot of controversy in the past couple months, um, going bankrupts and possible bankruptcy which could lead to toshiba's bankruptcy as a company so now they might have to sell off their most profitable um aspects of their company like their chip manufacturing wow to taiwan wow i'm going off on a tangent now but <laughs> that's they were they were the owners of the, the power plant um and so you know that by in one way or another, that affected my family as well. Not only there, but my dad, he's been there ever since. He lives there to this day. Not doing the nuclear remediation so much now because of some political reasons and the Japanese government kicking out all foreign uh, companies that were helping them. Uh, they wanted to do it themselves, which, okay, understandably, every government is entitled to do that. Right. Um, but, you know, it did affect my family. My father's still there working now. And, and, and not other capacities um so it was something that was important to me the subject in many ways that's why i wanted to make the documentary originally and when you got into making the documentary about what was going on there how did it evolve because you went out to japan did so so how did the the reality of showing up there affect the original story you were thinking you were going to tell how did how did it grow as you experienced what was going on there that's a really good question because I came with not, you know, an idea, my storyboards. I didn't have a specific script. I didn't even know exactly who I was going to talk to because I didn't, I didn't have that ability because uh, people have so much ambivalence. They didn't know you and Japan is such a relationship based culture that you can't just write a letter and say, Hey, I'm going to be friends and I'm going to film you. You have to go there, meet people and then almost have somebody guide you in you know like hey i'll vouch for you you're one of the family um which we did we had a somebody that worked at the local university up there um she's in our documentary she's her name is kumiko kumiko the guide and she introduced us to everybody she knew all the students she was like um, a miyagi university um like a school liaison and uh from there on it just she brought us to meet the most beautiful people and it opened up into a younger boy, a younger girl, um, an older fisherman, an older woman, a retired woman, um, a Buddhist sensei and herself and the story of all their stories getting intertwined together. Wow. 
and in the end what is what is the story that they're telling the story that they're telling is that they're resourceful that that they can make it um i asked everybody the same set of questions about what makes you want to continue on in life because these are people who lost everything like their whole families their whole house they're in temporary homes now even to this day temporary homes um what what would give you happiness what 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 would give you will to like you know not not want to die and and in the end it really came down to people finding purpose and enjoying the little things the little things like like meeting up with somebody to to go to tea being able to do laundry being able to do laundry they they missed that yeah walking to the grocery store to to buy something and, and with all your bags and walking back um the thing that really brought joy to people was and i i heard this across the board from people who weren't you know in many different areas the smile of other people from other countries coming to help them was the most important thing seeing other people's wow. smiles that reminder that things can be okay yeah I think that's one of those interesting things because we're we're several years down the road now, and pretty much all the discussion is about Fukushima. But you're right that that earthquake caused a tsunami that destroyed entire towns, whole seaside villages, and oh yeah, you're right, wiped out entire families and just wiped places completely off the map. Um, and I think that that gets forgotten in the discussion a lot the that, humans that that devastation was more than just that localized nuclear problem that everybody kind of continues to talk about today but it was a much broader um just horrific moment in time i remember watching it on tv uh with my buddy casey who actually, he lived in China for like five years. Uh, he's got a real affinity for Asian people. We were watching that just crying. Watching these people trying to outrun the waves and stuff. It was unbelievable what unbelievable. we were able to witness on television of that Live. moment. Um, how How soon after did you make your first trip out? Like how fresh was it for everybody when you first talked to uh, them? I first came out i think it was a little over two years in uh things had stabilized a little bit you know pretty much by then calm calm down but it it was you would think two years in an advanced country like japan oh it, it's all cleared up right intellectually you would think oh there's no reason to go talk to anybody anymore right it's two years down the road cars are piled up everywhere smashed on top of each other um abandoned homes that look like they got bombed in a war uh you know, and these aren't like nuclear places. These are places that you can actually just go that the wave messed up. Um, you know, forest devastated still. Nothing, nothing there. Um, broken, broken stumps of trees where people used to play and grew up, you know, maybe when they mm -hmm. were kids. Everything was gone. Um, and, you know, I think one of the, the most beautiful things in the end, you know, I, I went there with that that view of of kind of despair but making it there and, and going there about five years anniversary for our final check-in before the documentary got got released um really showed this beautiful like hope and reemergence, and like the the human the power and will to go on and to say we are not going anywhere you know we we will continue the replanting the forests they're building tsunami evacuation um, towers now. Farmers are coming back to the lands. You know, the fields are starting to turn green. The Japanese people seem to have a very just kind of innate ability to take tragedy and kind of stand up and continue on afterwards. I mean, look at the end of world war two, they, they suffered two of the most devastating moments in human history. And I think, a a less strong willed people 
could have really just collapsed under the weight of having had that happen to them. But oh yeah, the Japanese people seem to like come out even stronger after that, um, and forgave America for what they did to them. And like it's it's pretty incredible. That is the people of Japan. Um, because they is. they became a technological marvel. <laughs> Yeah, right. You know, by the by the seventies, um, just kind of rebuilt themselves into a completely different, um, different light, which is really interesting for a country that was so closed off for a long time too, right? The rate of change, I mean, I mean, it's it almost takes something like a nuclear bomb to enact that much change to go from like an empirical society to, yeah. You know, modern quote-unquote modern western world democracy mm-hmm. overnight you know overnight so what was it like for you as you know because i mean you, your family comes from japan but you you know you grew up here right sure yeah San so Diego. what was it like for you to go go there and um and experience firsthand the devastation that they experience to to see those cars piled up like how did that affect you as a person and and how did it affect your desire to tell this story you know the whole time people were wondering you know why is this outsider coming here why are they interviewing us like why why do you care like what well, you know you're not you don't even fully speak japanese you know you, you can't even fully communicate with us you need an interpreter like why why would you do this and you know, I, I couldn't fully explain all my reasons to everybody all the time. As I had told you before with my family, how it affected me, and I have family there. Um, on a personal level, uh, that time in my life, I was going through a lot of death in my family. So I just couldn't figure out why or how people could continue on with life. When I, myself, I was feeling so down at some points, you know, I was like super depressed Mm -hmm. and I couldn't figure out how to get past it. So in a way, I think I was, uh, searching for answers myself through them. Well, we're, we're storytellers, right? Um, I think that's why we become filmmakers. We like to tell stories. But oftentimes, I think the stories we choose to tell are a reflection of what we're going through. Um, I don't do documentaries, per se. I mean, I have, but I don't do them very often. But if you look at the, <laughs> if you look at the evolutions of my films, my, my fictional narratives, you can definitely see the emotional change in me as I've gone through loss and grief and, you know, the pains of life. The older I get, the kind of more... The less comedic and more dark my stories become, and sure. the more the more yes. they're about loss and grieving and the process of finding your way through it. Um, but I think there's something about going through your own personal tragedies. You want to connect to the other people who are feeling that. Yeah, it makes you vulnerable and open. Yeah, in some way, you know, you're able to, uh, you know, not relate to the same feelings, but. You know, in some sense, maybe they can feel your feelings, so you can come off genuine, maybe, yeah. you know? Well, I remember when my dad died, which will be 10 years ago this summer, um, you know, he wasn't the first, you know, first person that I experienced dying, but he was certainly probably the most important person in my life up to that point. And when he died, um, one of his friends pulled me aside, and his wife had died of cancer a few years ahead of my dad. He pulled me aside at my dad's viewing and said, okay, look, I just want to tell you this. He's like, you're about to go into a period of your life where there's going to be a separation. There's going to be the people who you meet who have been through tragic loss. And there's going to be people who haven't yet experienced it. And there's a, def- there's a definitive line between them. He says, and because of that definitive line, there's going to be people who just... They don't know what you're going through. They, they, they can't relate to it. They're going to try. True. And somebody's going to tell you that their cat died recently or their dog died recently and they know what you're going through. 
He's like, you're going to want to strangle them. Don't. <laughs> he says, because they're just trying to relate in whatever mini school way that they can. And they don't mean to sound disrespectful of the loss you're going through. They're just desperately trying to figure out how to connect with you and, and don't hold it against them. <laughs> I was like, yeah, okay, whatever. You That's know? a good point. Yeah. But he was right. You know, and it, it actually took a couple of months, but a couple of months later, uh, you know, a, a good friend of mine, I, I started breaking down on one of our film sets and she came up to me and she was crying too. And she's like, I lost my cat last week and I know what you're going through. I, I feel so bad. Uh, you know? <laughs> and I, I immediately stopped crying and looked at her and went, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the tears were done for me i was like holy crap he was right and i do feel like i want to strangle this person but he's right she's just trying to connect and she doesn't know any other way and i sat down and kind of chilled out for a little bit and she disappeared and was doing stuff and then she came back 10 minutes later she's like oh my god i was so insensitive i don't mean to imply that my cat was anywhere near as important to me as your father was to you and i'm like no really it's fine i, I understand but I could totally see if you were right in the midst of, of dealing with, with that kind of loss in your own personal life, seeing that happen over there and knowing what was going on over there, I could see how your heart would want you to go there and, and connect. Absolutely. And, and tell, tell their stories because maybe through telling their stories, you could find some healing for yourself too. Absolutely. That's beautiful, man. Absolutely. I remember when you were going, I desperately wanted to go with you. <laughs> I know. I wanted you to go. I wish I had money. That's, <laughs> I was such a budget production, you know, but I felt like it was a really important story and it, people came together to get the story told. And, uh, you know, ever since then, we built a really, really cool community, you know, both here and in Japan. Um, LA is very supportive of 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 not only the Japanese community and then the situation, but there is like a, a sistership between cities, specifically um, Santa Monica. Mm -hmm. Santa Monica has named March 11th in, in memory of the Japanese tragedy that took place, uh, a day of remembrance and a day of preparedness for earthquakes and tsunamis. Wow. I had and, no idea. Yeah. That's Santa cool. Monica. Um, they're really, really been supportive. Just amazing. So, once you were done shooting everything, and you were back here editing the piece together, how uh, how did revisiting those interviews go for you? How did that? Because it's one thing to sit there and and go through the discussion with somebody, but sitting in an edit bay where it's just you and the story, sure. How did that affect you to sit and and, and re listen to their stories over and over again? Did you find healing for yourself in knowing you were helping them tell their stories? Yeah. I mean, there was very frustrating days sitting there because the emotion was always there, but it wasn't fresh and you want to keep it fresh for, especially for the audience. And if I'm not fully bilingual, trying to deal with bilingual editing issues, um, the little idiosyncrasies, and people started to sh to show, and I, I I feel like I know them way more than they know me. You know, right? I see their little mannerisms day in and day out, and I'm thinking about them waking up and and going to sleep. You know, and they may think of me every once in a month or if that, you know, whatever. Um, and I I thought it was like very very rewarding that after i got all the editing done and i was able to go back there and and show them what we had so far it wasn't the finished project but it was nearly finished and we wanted to do our last touch-ups that you know they were so appreciative and so grateful that we, we stuck with it told their story and they recognized that that was them they're like wow that's not even me anymore like, I always thought of them, that's them, you know, it's still to this day. It's been two years even after, you know. Right, they were frozen in time for you. They were in frozen. In that moment that you interviewed them. Absolutely. But when they saw that, they're like, that's not me. Wow. And they thanked me for capturing that, that them 
in that time because nobody had done that. Mm -hmm. But they realized that that wasn't them anymore. They had moved on. You know, they they have gone on to try to to take back their lives. And so it was kind of a lesson for me not to get stuck. They moved on. You know, why am I still stuck and thinking of them in that position in life? You know, it was just kind of this like, boom, like this light clicked light on in my head. Moment. Yeah. It's like, wow. A wow moment. That's incredible. So did you get to shoot kind of that little bit of them acknowledging that they've moved on in that part of yeah. the film? Yeah. That's we cool. We went back and, and did a premiere. We rented a restaurant. We had about 20 of us together in uh, in the Sendai. And you know we had a, a projection screen had a whole dinner and showed everyone and it, it was magic you know there's there's family members coming together and, and checking stuff out and it was really special and then in those moments we were able to capture that and then add that to the very end of uh, the film that's really cool that's really cool yeah yeah moving on i mean that's that's the thing when you're in the throes of grief like you just can't see tomorrow true you know and and, and the advice I try and give a lot of my friends when they finally hit that moment, you know, that moment I was talking, that defining moment where it's like there was you before this yeah, and there's you after and the two aren't the same person. Yep. Right. But when you hit that moment, the, the immediate aftermath, it's like you just have to focus on putting one foot in front of the other and not worry about looking down the path. True. <laughs> because it's just so hard to get that next step in your life next step next step you can't even plan ahead because you just can't see can't it. see it absolutely grief man. is like the densest deepest fog you can find yourself in um that's amazing that's amazing that it took the return trip there for that light bulb for you to go off how much time was in True. between those trips uh it was about a three-year span from when we started until we uh, did our final, you know, our, our premiere in Los Angeles on the anniversary day. We did, we did the five-year anniversary rem- uh, memorial in Little Tokyo. We had the premiere of the film on that day. Wow. Amazing. How was it received by the general audience? The funny thing is, it, there's a tight community of Japanese people, Japanese Americans living in here, uh, who, who witnessed it primarily, and they had the same kind of questions as many people had like, why, you know, why do you care? You know, you're not fully Japanese. You don't fully speak Japanese. Why, why are you doing this still? And I still kind of felt like an outsider Mm -hmm. and I have many relationships. You know, I have Japanese blood flowing through me. I have many friends, you know, it's not everyone, but there was definitely the segments of, of the community that still sees me as an outsider and didn't really acknowledge, I guess, the fact of like what I was trying to do. But right. hey, what are you going to do? You know, <laughs> can't please everybody. Right? Yeah. And I think in the end, it sounds like uh, you made the documentary because it's what you needed to make for you. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Which I've been told by people who make documentaries, that's the only reason to make them. Because <laughs> you have a need to tell a story. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. Uh, that's true, actually. Yep. Come to think of it, that's just a good rule of thumb from telling any movie. Yeah. <laughs> if, you, if you don't have the need to tell it, you probably don't need to be making it. <laughs> <laughs> Regardless of who you are and where you come from. This whole the whole business is so complicated anyway. So what uh, what happened with the film after you were done premiering it? Um, have you taken it to any festivals? Have you? Um, yeah, we we've entered it into quite a few festivals, and you know we just haven't had a huge response. It seems like a lot of people don't care, you know, which is discouraging and disheartening. But uh, you know, we live in a world where there's so many news stories and and so many things going on, and it's it's hard to make people care. And one of the the biggest things that the, the one of the main messages that people in Japan want us to say is like the worst feeling in the world is to be forgotten. Right. Don't forget us. And so in a way, this is us to try to give the biggest voice possible to them to not be forgotten, regardless if, you know, we get into big festivals or not. 
you know, we just want to give them a platform for the stories to be told. So, um, right now we're trying to go on to, you know, let it be seen on Amazon because we think that's the best platform for internationally right now. So that's where we're currently trying to work to get distribution with them. Um, yeah. Uh, I want to hook you up with uh, with our contacts at KPBS in San Diego, to see if we get it aired. That would be cool. Yeah, I, I think we'll we should do that. <laughs> that would be awesome. Let me, let me let me make some calls. Yeah, <laughs> Boston. Uh, be awesome. See, see what we can work out. I would appreciate um, that. Because you know, documentaries, man, they're hard. Um, you don't see a lot of documentaries theatrically released. And with the exception of a few, you don't see them on television a whole lot either. No. No. Yeah. Um, but so many documentaries need to be seen. I just think people don't even know where to find them. True. Very true. You know, you get the you get the claims from programmers and stuff that, oh, people don't want to watch that, you know, we won't get the ratings except mm-hmm. How do you know that if you're never putting them out anymore? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Taste change. We're in a real weird world right now where I think people want information constantly. Mm-hmm. Um, not just to be entertained, but I think people want to be educated. Yeah. Certainly most of the people I talk to want to be educated. Um, now, how deeply they want to be educated. Maybe they're just all headline readers. I don't know. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. It's it's a strange world. <laughs> I think we're all still trying to figure it out. Yeah. But man, I I I really wanted to go with you when I heard you were doing the trip. Um just you know, I dated a, a Japanese girl after 9/11 actually. Oh, really? Yeah, like and I think we got together after 9-11 just because I, I, you know, like we needed, we needed each other to kind of get through the feeling that wow. we were going through, you know, after 9-11 happened. Wow. Um, she was a beautiful, wonderful woman. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm half Filipino, so I've always had an affinity for that part of the world. You sure. Know? It's, sure. It's, it's I'm a bit further south, but you know, it's hey. all brothers and sisters. It's all that 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 region of the world and and my dad loved uh Japanese culture. Just Love. loved it. His time in Japan when he was serving in the navy was some of his best memories. Huh. Um and actually it was discussions my dad had about visiting Japan that have kind of affected how I like to travel and stuff. Um when he and his buddies uh, got shore leave in Japan, they got off the boat and they decided they wanted to really experience Japanese culture in a way that they just couldn't by the docks, right? Okay. Like, just a lot of English speaking Japanese by the docks. Everything had English subtitles. <laughs> yeah. Know? Like, yeah. Yeah. Like they weren't experiencing the real Japan. So they hopped on the trains. And they made the decision that they were going to ride the trains until they saw no English in the station. <laughs> That's amazing. And they they rode out. And they finally got out to some town. He couldn't tell you the name of it. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I have no idea what the name of this, this town was. But it was a tiny little town. And there was no English anywhere. We got off the train. We're the only white people in the entire city. Perfect. <laughs> He's like... <laughs> And we walked the streets, and we were hungry, and we didn't know what was a restaurant, what was a library. He's like, it's just <laughs> we had no idea, so we just followed our noses till we smelled something nice. Yeah, and we went inside, and he's like, it was obviously like a little mom and pop, you know, restaurant. Yeah, and he says this wonderful little ja- old Japanese guy comes out and hands him menus, and can't read it. Away. <laughs> <laughs> and then comes back and says something to them in Japanese. And my dad says he just, and his buddies just kind of shrugged. They <laughs> gestured at the menu and made the kind of universal shrug of, I have no idea. 
<laughs> and he goes, American. <laughs> and he says the he said the most beautiful thing was this little old Japanese guy looks and oh, oh, you know, takes the menus out of the hands and just kind of bows. shakes shakes and bows and <laughs> shakes and bows and walks away. <laughs> My dad's like I had no idea if he was bringing us food or <laughs> or what. <laughs> Uh, he's like, so we just sat there drinking our tea, you yeah. know, talking and just kind of soaking in all the art and everything that was around. Yeah. And he says, uh, 10, 15 minutes later, the guy comes back out from the back with a couple of what he assumed was his sons <laughs> <laughs> and they come out and they just like put this entire feast on the table in front of them. Wow. All these different flavors and types of foods you know things that my dad had never seen before he had no idea what it was you know yeah yeah but uh you know he started eating and says it was one of the best meals he ever had in his life yeah and the bill comes out and he puts the guy puts the bill down <laughs> my dad says he looks at him and goes i don't know you know shrugs again <laughs> pulls his wallet out and just pulls all the money out and puts it on the table on top of the bill my dad's like every do every Every bit of money I had, I put on the table. Like, he could have taken everything I had. Yeah. Because I just didn't know. Yeah. And he said it was the most amazing thing. He goes, oh. And starts counting out the bills, you know. Yeah. And hands me back a large chunk of it, takes two bills away, comes back with change. Wow. <laughs> He's like, uh, it was incredible. That is the best way to travel ever. Yeah, and I, my dad told me that story, and I just, uh, I was like, that's, that's what I want to do. And so after my dad yeah. died, uh, a couple years after my dad died, and after I broke up with my girlfriend, and I was going through my grieving process. Um, this was the year before three eleven. Year before, um, or the year of maybe. I uh, I basically quit everything. <laughs> And, like, gave my brother-in-law my clients and uh, started volunteer crewing on sailboats and well, was learning how to sail, like, the hard way. <laughs> I didn't take a class. I just started jumping on people's boats and learning as we went. Wow. And I uh, ended up sailing with this little old lady down to Ensenada from, from San Diego. And um, I hopped on a train. I did the summer. Oh, I did the rail shit. USA Rail Pass and really hopped on the train and took the train all over the country, you know, and uh, wow. went sailing in New York and outside of DC and uh, yeah, no idea. made my way up to Lake Michigan and sailed on Lake Michigan for a few weeks and just just crewing on different people's boats. Wow, um, and getting out of normal tourist stuff, you know, yeah. Just, Taking your dad's experience Experiencing life in a different way, you know, it was amazing. It was such a good experience, and it was to, it was totally inspired by my dad. Um, and and as I journeyed, I brought a little camera and I was interviewing people. You yeah, know, this was pre podcast and everything. Yeah, yeah. I was interviewing people. I had a website and I was posting videos of all these people I was meeting. And wow, so I wanted to meet people who lived on their boats. Huh. You know, the the cruisers, the real cruisers, the circumnavigators. And I met all kinds of people who live their life in totally different ways from anything I, I would have ever imagined. It was cool. And you got to experience it. Yeah. And live it. Yeah, live it and be there. And yeah. It, 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 I think... Wow. I think that for me is what I like about being a storyteller. Is like, I'm willing to jump out there and go discover the stories. Yeah, and I know not everybody else can or has the kind of emotional capacity to just drop whatever they have and go do those sorts of things. But they should hear the stories. And that's where I feel like that's our job in life. Your job, my job, the filmmakers who listen to the show. <laughs> you know, sure. Like, our job is to show the people who can't do the things that we do what life is like when you can. <laughs> you that know? is very well said. And very well said. You know, there's a lot of people who uh, don't view, you know, Hollywood or filmmaking as a noble profession or anything. Not at all. And yeah. I find that so insulting because mm -hmm. every culture has had their storytellers. Right? Yeah. 
be it Shakespeare or hula dancers <laughs> or hula dancers. Yeah, I mean the the art Oral of telling history. story through hula is amazing. My mom was a hula dancer. Oh really? Yeah, it's the same thing, right? Yeah, they didn't. Ha- that was the popular media of the time. Yeah, they don't have TVs or radios, and yeah, I don't think it's, it's I, beautiful. I, I don't think a lot of people even realize that a hula dance is telling a story. No, I don't think so. I lived there and went to school there. That's the only you reason, know, you know. Like, it's like you have to be every educated. Every motion get... tells a component of the story. Like it's so beautiful. And really, every really dance cool. is a unique story. And it's their their creation stories. It's it's mm-hmm. the stories that they would pass from child, you know, mother to child and things that shouldn't be forgotten that they didn't want forgotten. They put yep. it in dance. Yep. Amazing. Yeah, storytelling is such an important part of civilization. And anybody who tells us as storytellers that, you know, we should get a real job, I think they can all go to hell. (laughs) Personally, they can all go to hell. Yeah, my life is complicated. I'm probably never going to own a house. But I don't feel like my life is complete unless I'm telling these stories. Unless I'm journeying out and experiencing the world on behalf of people who can't. And in some way, I think the stories we tell enriches their lives and and hopefully lets them see things that they wouldn't understand otherwise. Yeah. A different light. I mean, we are the communicators of the the human experience. Mm -hmm. And experiences are often one-sided. Yeah, if you're one place, you get blinded to not see these the points and views of other people. Yeah. Actually, that's an interesting point. In terms of people asking you, why you? You barely speak Japanese. You know, you're, you're not really from there. Yep. All the things that they might have told you. I think that's why you needed to tell the story. Because you're that third-party perspective. You were able to kind of tell their story you know, from the outside, bias, you know, just as an outsider looking in, that's and a good point. That's an important perspective to have. That's because really if you're too point. ingrained in the story, you maybe don't see all the nuances of it because you yourself are too tied into it. That is a very good point. Never thought about it like that. <laughs> you're welcome to use that next time. <laughs> 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 But no, I think it's I think it's true. I think it's important that you have different perspectives on a story. Like and obviously the the primary perspective is the people telling it. So you you're getting that primary perspective by talking to them. Mm-hmm. But to be a third party observer kind of analyzing the story they're telling, you're able to maybe get past some of the biases that they have of their story themselves. It's very true. And tell it maybe in a I don't want to say more truthful manner, but maybe in a much more matter of fact manner that's not not as affected by personal experiences that they went through. Sure. You're able to kind of get to the 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 meat of the bones, if you will, you know. Um and tell the story that needs to be told. I I am in awe of documentary filmmakers. No money. Work your life off <laughs> yeah. years and years. Yeah, yeah. Many, many people work work you know a decade or more on some of their stories. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. But boy, like to have that that compulsion, that need, that never ending desire to tell that story. Like, I I am in awe of that. the The fact that you took three years to tell your story to build that up together. You know, I get frustrated when a project's taking me six months to complete. (laughs) Oh, the frustration. You know, there's always frustration. Um, What is next for you? Like, do you have another story lined up that you're dying to tell? I really do. Yeah. Yeah. A really big one. Um, And I want to make sure I do it right. And it's, it's important for me because... Again, if it's a, you, you're telling stories of like where you're from and things that are affect you. Growing up in San Diego, I always felt that we didn't have, I mean, we have our California history, but it's never been, you know, told. It's not like, you know, the Kings of New York come to New York, you know, Jamestown, the Puritans, you know, you got all these like 
histories of, of Greece and Rome, and then here's California. Okay, cool. We're like, we got Billy the Kid. There's some Western town. There's a gold rush. But well, most of the history that we learn about for California is is just rooted in the European conquest of California. Yeah, like we don't talk about the what hundreds of Indian tribes that existed in California prior to them. Hundreds. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so so one of the things that's it's important is, uh, the Mexican American War that time mm -hmm. and the bridging and the, the the how California, which was actually really big, it was like Arizona, New Mexico, it was like huge, but. That story of uh, California becoming part of America, that's, that's the next venture, I think. Neat. Because I think it like there's so much prejudice. And in a day, in an age where there's so much divide and hate, uh, a story I feel like this could really bring people together to show, you know, we're all the same. And this is how we became together as a country. Yeah, I mean, if you think about, you think about how diverse California is today. Um, it's been one of the most diverse places in our country since we became a country. Like yeah. from the moment it started getting absorbed as part of America, it was it, again hundreds of different Indian tribes across the Southland. Um, and, and like you said, California early on, Arizona and Southern Nevada and that like whole region was California. You know, you had amazing diversity already. Yeah. Before the Europeans even came here. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Know, it's, uh, it's pretty incredible. You know, one of my favorite things to do is, is journey around and hit all the different, uh, uh, Native American ruins, uh, the cliff dwellings. Oh, amazing! I mean, just amazing cliff dwellings and, and amazing, and, yeah, and adobes and and uh, the drawings. So much rich history if you're willing to take the journey and look into it. Right. Um. You know, Canyon de Chez in Navajo Nation, and uh, the Gila cliff dwellings in southern New Mexico, um, Mesa Verde. You know, way up there in in southern Colorado, and Dude, I've never even been over there. Uh, incredible, really incredible experiences, like mind altering Whoa. experiences. Visiting these these ruins and these natural temples. Um, Canyon de Chez is uh, where Spider Rock is, and it's where the Navajo people believe their creation uh, sprouted from. Oh, cool. This incredible, beautiful valley, canyon valley in the middle of their lands. Huh. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's absolutely stunning. Um, if you have any desire to collaborate on the history stuff in this region, like I'd love to jump in and help you. Oh, man. That. Um, yeah. Cause I, I, I find the history of this area just incredible. San Diego history is, so interesting and it never gets told i mean i just don't know why well San, yeah san diego's san diego alone had what 15 or 20 different indian tribes yeah i mean I, what I'm, we call san diego county today, right i can't even know? tell you i don't, I don't know for sure but <laughs> I mean, it's incredible they all traded amount. with one another and 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 uh, traded with you know indians from further east and mm -hmm. it's um it's fascinating. It really is. It's fascinating. And they were, they were very, they weren't as primitive as people like to believe, I think. Mm hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we always talk about, uh, the great Roman cultures and the aqueducts and, you know, they did amazing things, uh, in their time. But I think what Native Americans did, at the height of their culture, I think is every bit as impressive. Yeah. Very different. Very different. Every bit as impressive. Yeah. Um, like I said, you go stand in a place like Mesa Verde where there's all these giant castles built into the cliff faces 
um, you know, where entire communities lived, you know, 600 wow. people, 700 people. Like the Petra and Jordan thing where they similar to out. that. They didn't carve it out though. They, they literally built inside because the way these cave, they're, they're not cave caves. They're, they're big enclaves. So the way the winds blow into the sand and limestones berms just, it out. Yeah. They just oh. build these big berms, natural berms. And they built inside these, these enclaves. Wow. Uh, it's, I'll really check incredible. that out. Yeah. Huh. You want to take a road trip? Like I'm down. <laughs> I'll <laughs> yeah. go visit anytime. Go wow. camping and stuff. Like it's it's that a sounds spiritual amazing. thing. Like I I love it. Absolutely huh. love it. And uh every time I'm in those in those dwellings and stuff, I keep thinking like there are stories to be told here. Oh yeah. You know, there there's something that needs to be told here. I don't know what it is yet myself, but somebody's got to do it. <laughs> um and telling their story and the transition from them to the European occupation of these lands, I think, would be a really interesting tale. To how we are today. To where we're at today. Like, that's a long journey. That's a long journey. Um, be, a, be a fascinating story to tell. Right? Important. Yeah. Important. I mean, so much, so much history. So much of what's affecting the world today happened in this area of the world in the last 200 years that is a good point yeah i mean technology all this the span and, and how it, it bolt mushroom clouded from california the the cultural ramifications of hollywood yeah the californication effect quote unquote you know yeah I mean, look at look at what the Hollywood industry has spurred and spawned in uh, Hong Kong, in India. Um, huge power hubs for making movies now. Right. You know, huge. Right. And they come to you know places like Los Angeles and go to Warner Brothers, and they have people help them build. Hey, I want a Warner Brothers lot. I want Sound Stadium. An example of like, hey, they did, this is how they did it over there. I want this over here. And then you could spread your culture. I mean, that's back in the days you weren't Greek unless you were like, you were Hellenized. You know right. what I mean? Hel Hellenization was adhering to Greek culture. You know, you could still be Egyptian and be Greek if you were Hellenized. Right. Well, you get, you hear that term Westernization all the time. And I don't think it's Westernization so much as it is, as it is Californication. Californication. Because so much of westernized civilization is is known and seen through the eyes of Hollywood. That is a very good point. That is a very good point. I mean, you think about when you talk to somebody from overseas who who comes here and say they only get to see Disneyland, you know, <laughs> um, or or L.A. They think the entire country's like that. Sure. And I, I've had a lot of discussions with people. I'm like, well, I don't think you really understand how diverse and large our country is. <laughs> yeah. And how incredibly different everything is from L.A. <laughs> you know, L.A., New York, Chicago. Like, those are the kind of three cities that they're aware of. Mm -hmm. And they think everything is like those three places. And it's just not the case. Um. And I start to talk about things like our cliff dwellings and, you know, the mountains, and the, the vast deserts and the, the enormous plains. And yeah. you try to get them to understand that it takes a week to drive across this country <laughs> yeah. if you're doing 80 miles an hour right. and driving 10 hours a day. It takes five days, five whole days to get across this country. You can fit the entirety of, of Europe. Europe within our boundaries and still have space and look how diverse people consider europe you know italy to right? london to paris well i think that's one of the things too though is like europeans they view themselves as a lot of independent countries but they look at america as america and they don't they don't get that the the states for all our unity are individual countries yeah nobody sees that i mean, it, I mean this election kind of really brought it out into light about how independent each state is but 
Yeah, it's. Uh... <laughs> but being able to to keep that together as a, one, you know, one solid unit and the unity, you know, is is it's amazing. A great experiment. The great experiment. There you go. Yeah, the democracy of America is the great experiment. It's a experiment that's two hundred something years in the making now. Yeah, but it's still a baby in the grand scale of governments in the world. Yeah, you know. Yeah, um, especially. You look at a country like England or France, mm-hmm. you know, we, we, we are just infants in the grand scheme of things, um, but we're infants who wield a really big stick in the world. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. It's kind of, it's kind of terrifying. <laughs> and we had the opportunity to learn and from everyone else's failures, from them doing everything, you know, and being like, uh, okay, well that didn't work. Unfortunately... If you look at the great civilizations of the world, even even England and France, um, you know, they've gone from monarchies to parliamentaries, Prussian Empire you know, to the USSR, everything to comes and goes, Russia. comes and goes, comes and goes. And at some point in time, America as we currently know it is going to go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look at old maps. Sooner or later it's going to happen. I don't think any government is meant to last forever. Sure. Um, things things change. Uh, the powers that be gain too much control, and you have to kind of hit the reset button. You find your Rubicon River, you know? <laughs> yeah. So You hope you can identify it before you cross it. Exactly. What a gorgeous day. It's days like this I wish the podcast was video. <laughs> right? I could show people the beautiful view we've got here. We're on the sixth floor at the JW Marriott, overlooking the pools, the what do you call it? Is this a lake? It's there's an like oasis. A, there's like it's an oasis. The pools are on the oasis, but the the lake kind of stretches around the resort. And they 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 have gondolas and stuff that go in this lake. They right. take you to your restaurant. You want to go to sushi? You take a little boat. A <laughs> take boat. a little boat. And the resort's big enough that taking a little boat makes sense. Um, but we're sitting here in the desert, and in the distance is the beautiful mountain peak with snow on top. I, Joey that, Nava was telling me we can hike up that. Yeah. There's a, there's a, it's a, I think he said it's a 10 mile. No, it's a five mile path to get to the top. Wow. But it'd take you, like, most of the day. It's like a constant... It's a five-mile ascent. <laughs> five-mile ascent. A <laughs> world of... So I think that peak's 10,000 feet up. Oh, really? Yeah. It's wow. like the tallest peak in Southern California. That crazy. one and that one over there. It's crazy. So we actually can see two snow-capped peaks from where we're sitting here in the desert. Giant oxymoron. <laughs> That we're sitting here. <laughs> well, that's the diversity of California, right? Um, California has like 10 of the 12 uh, uh, weather patterns of the world. Oh, really? Right? <laughs> I didn't know that. No. Yeah. I'm, it's crazy. Especially you've done the drive to Seattle. Oh, yeah. So you go from down here. Oh, man. It's all desert, desert, desert and dry. And you start driving north. And by mm-hmm. the time you get to the northern part of California, it's super tall pine trees. Uh, and 180. Mountains. And <laughs> you know, everything's just green, 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 right? Emerald Triangle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Such So much diversity green, in California. Green, green. Not, just, not just the people, but the land, too, which is why they made movies here. Uh-huh. Exactly. That is actually the founding of Hollywood if you study the history. Yep. So you could shoot desert, mountains, ocean, all in what one place based out of LA. That was the big draw. You know this is where they filmed uh Saved by the Bell, right? An episode of Saved by the Bell was filmed here. They shot an episode of Saved by the Bell here? On those boats. Yeah, when Jesse's dad was getting remarried. <laughs> 
they all came here. I mean, you should Google this episode. Oh my God. Okay. And they, and they, and everything you're seeing, they jumped on the boats. They would go in here. I mean, it was like, it was like a two episode thing too. It was like a whole Saved by the Bell. I don't remember that episode. Special. It was amazing. Oh. Was that one of the later years? Yeah, it was one of the ones. Remember, they started doing like, oh, we're going to go on the beach. We're doing like Malibu Beach Club episodes. We're doing like Hawaii episodes. Yeah, that was around the time that I left for college and stopped watching Saved by the Bell. <laughs> but yeah, Jesse's dad was getting remarried and she didn't like it. And they would work going that gym down there uh, that we're looking at. It's like now the biggest loser. That's where they filmed the biggest loser. <laughs> uh, Jesse story was really judgmental. Very judgmental. She did not like the new blonde bimbo that she called her. And then she went on to do showgirls. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that. And we've barely heard from her since. <laughs> I forgot about that. That was classic. That was a classic. classic. <laughs> yeah, right? Uh, apparently it's got some sort of huge cult following. Yeah. I tried watching it again like a year or so ago. I was like, no, this is still just the shitty movie it always was. <laughs> it doesn't get better with time. <laughs> oh, my God. Showgirls. Oh, that's hilarious. Well, Austin, thanks for chatting with me. It's my pleasure, man. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, it's always good to talk to uh, friends on my podcast. Yeah, man. I mean, we've known each other for... A good while now. Quite a while, yeah. Eight years or something? Probably, huh? Yeah. So, uh, we, we work AV gigs together. Mm -hmm. We talk film constantly while we're doing AV gigs. <laughs> so, uh, we might as well turn the microphones on and talk about <laughs> your movie. Thank um, you. For everybody else to hear. Um, what is the full title of your film? So that uh, people can kind of keep an eye out for it in case it shows up on Amazon. Uh, it's called Kyo Today. K-Y-O slash today. Kyo is today in Japanese. Cool. Yeah. And uh, yeah, if you um, if you find yourself with a distribution deal set up, let me know and I'll be sure to let everybody know when they can catch it. Oh, I appreciate that very much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. And thank you for taking the time to tell a story, um, which was obviously a very personal journey for you as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I know nobody could see it, but I think they might have heard it. But you were you were full on crying while we were doing this podcast. It was touching, man. Yeah. Um. So, uh, you know, thanks for putting yourself out there. Thanks for for taking the time to to tell the stories of those those people out there. Um, happy I got the opportunity to be able to do that. Yeah, I'd be blessed that they entrusted their story to me to be able to let that be told. Yeah. And uh, if you haven't already, please subscribe to the podcast. Uh, your subscription via iTunes or iHeartRadio or Google Play helps raise the visibility of the show for everybody. Um, so subscribe. It doesn't cost you anything. It's just a matter of hitting a button. Subscribe. And then your podcasts from us will be fed to your phone as they come out. So theoretically, you don't miss any episodes that way. And Theoretically, the more of you subscribe, the higher up we go in the rankings and the more likely strangers are to find the show. And uh, as our audience grows, so too will our list of uh, of guests. Um, and, uh, you know, that's just fun for me and it, I think it's fun for you. So uh, be sure to hit the subscribe button. And if you haven't visited our YouTube page, uh, now's the time. Go to YouTube.com and look for Intellectual Entertainment. We've got a whole slew of stuff there uh, that you can check out. And we are just about ready to launch a whole slew of new shows this summer. Um, we started doing our trailer reactions uh, recently. Um, that's just kind of a beginning test of moving ourselves into more of a YouTube presence. So be sure to check out Intellectual Entertainment on YouTube. You can find us on Facebook. Facebook.com slash intellectual entertainment. We're on Instagram uh, as at the intellectual. You can also find us on Twitter at the intellectual. Until next time, I'm Dave Dawson. Thanking Austin Auger for joining us on the show. Thank you very much. And we will catch you all again soon. Hello there, citizens. I am the terror that flaps in the night. 
I am the floaty that will not flush no matter how many times you try in the toilet bowl of crime. I am Darkwing Duck, telling you please, talk hard and enjoy the mindgasm. <laughs> Whatever the heck that means. After all, you are watching Intellectual Podcast with your ears. Intellectual Podcast.